Hi everyone, so welcome to the live stream today. Very much excited for having you. Today we are going on to one of the critical areas uh, in financial reporting and by extension corporate reporting and to look at some of the IFRS masterclass content and we are focusing on IAS 33 that is earnings per share. This is by far one of the fundamental accounting standards that you need to understand in order for you to position yourself to ultimately pass the exams and I see some of you joining you hit the like button on the video and then uh, comment in the chat box any questions that you have for me. I see uh, some comments coming in there. I'm going to be uh, replying to all of your comments as much as I can. And most importantly, like I said, put it in the chat box, the topics you would want me to cover on the channel and then consider also... Okay, so let's see i'm in my chat there okay so domi jamila said please can you do ias 29 okay jamila jamin sorry okay so financial reporting in hyper inflation economies okay so we will look at that we will add it to the topic slides and then we'll look at it Kwachi Isaac, good job, Inshira. Thank you, Kwachi. You are welcome to the stream. Give us a thumbs up on the video when you join. We are looking at IAS 33 earnings per share, one of the fundamental accounting standards that you need to understand to position yourself to pass the exams. So you put in the comment box any questions you have uh, for me, topics you would want me to cover. On the channel as we continue with our discussion remember we have eight more weeks to go approximately about eight more weeks uh, to go so make sure that you are working hard Zolak I see you with an emoji in the chat box you're welcome to the stream comment below any questions you have for me comment below in the chat box with any questions that you have for me. So IAS 33 earnings per share. IAS 33 earnings per share. Earnings per share. Now I'm going to take my time to explain this fundamental accounting standard because it's very critical to the syllabus and to your understanding of financial reporting. And like I said, by extension, corporate uh, reporting as well and we're going to be touching on various uh, things to be able to uh, assist you to understand how to do the treatment and everything now primarily when we are talking about any special we are simply talking about in a simple language if we share the profits that a company has earned during the year under consideration how much will each shareholder get that is what we mean by earning spare share so basically it simply means the amount of profit that is attributable to the equity shareholders of the organization but then we're going to be diving deeper into that in a moment but primarily earning spare share can be divided into two we have what is called the basic earning spare share and then the diluted earning spare share and we'll get uh, into the details in a moment about all of these. Now, the basic earnings per share simply has to do with the earnings per share based on what is happening in the company currently. So, what the current shareholders of the company will be making based on the profits of the company, that is what the basic earnings per share is. And then the diluted earnings per share is more or less like a hypothesis. All right? So, like... Uh, we are imagining that should something happen in the future, what will be the potential, what will be the effect of that on our earnings per share as an organization? And that is where the diluted earnings per share is going to be coming into the picture. Now, the, earnings per, the diluted earnings per share is not realistic. It is not what is happening actually right now. However, it is something that is going to be happening in the future. So the diluted earnings per share is like a hypothesis. So we are just hypothesizing and finding out, okay, what if A and B happens and we'll get into the details on this. Under basic earnings per share, we're gonna be covering three things. 
We will look at where a company issues shares at full market price. We should have taken this up a little bit though. Then we will look at how we deal with calculating the earnings per share when company issues bonus issues, and we'll get into these in a moment. And then the third thing is going to be right issues. Right issues. So under the basic earnings per share, we're going to be discussing these three guys, the full market price, the bonus issue, and then the right issues. Then under the diluted earnings per share, which is my personal favorite area, we're going to be looking at dealing with convertible shares or convertible loan notes, or let me say convertible financial instrument. That is a generic statement. We'll clarify that in a moment. And then share options. Share options. So basically, we're going to be trying as much as possible to cover these five items when it comes to dealing with the earnings per share. Like I mentioned, the basic earnings per share has to do with what is happening currently, what is happening within the organization presently, what, how, how much profit that when we share the profit of the company that each shareholder is going to be making right now, today, right now. That is the basic earnings per share. Then the diluted earnings per share is what is likely to happen in the future. So that, for instance, if you are currently a shareholder and you are earning, say, 20 cents per share, wait till some people who have rights to convert some financial instruments into shares. When they convert, probably you will now be earning maybe 17 cents. And that is the issue about diluted earnings per share. We're going to be getting into these later on as well as we move on with our discussion. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome to the stream. Consider to give us a thumbs up on the video. That way we get more engagement on the video and YouTube will be able to push the video so we can reach as many students as possible. So together we can uh, assist a lot of students across the country and across the continent at large. And also most importantly, put it in the chat box what you want me to cover, the topics you want me to treat on the channel so I can assist you better to prepare well for your exams. I see some comments coming in. Let me reply to them real quick. Richard Opoku Ajima, I see you with a thumbs up uh, in, in the chat. Zolak said, does this cover the standard including the aspect examinable for corporate reporting? Yes, this is a, this is a cross standard. What is in financial reporting is the same thing that is in corporate reporting, so it's very critical there. Vincent Owusu said, uh, God bless you, Shira. Amen. God bless you too. Malfoy J said, Glory. Always a blessing to be part of your live stream. It's always a pleasure. Um, Charles Chilesi. Okay, Charles Chilesi. I guess you have retracted your message or deleted your message, so you can retype that out. Gabriel Koku said, Sir, please, can you solve a standard question on P and L statement and financial position with us? Yeah, definitely we will be able to do that. So let me add that to my topic slides real quick. Uh, let's see what you got here. A lot of things in my... Let's see where I have that. Okay. So let me add that to it. We're going to solve a question on that, Gabriel. So you stay connected. Definitely we'll solve a question on that. Come on, I need to convert this before. All right. Uh-oh. So let's see. So final accounts questions. I think I have that already covered somewhere. Okay, not really. So financial statements preparation in FR. So Gabriel, you stay connected. Definitely we will cover that on the channel. Then let's see uh, who else is coming in. Um, Charles. Uh, Chileshi. Now, if I mention your name wrong, please forgive me, okay? Charles said, please do do related party transaction in IAS 37. Now, for IAS 37, I already have a content on that on the channel. So, Charles, you can check that out before we shoot a new one. But I related party transaction, that is IAS 24. I guess we've not covered that on the channel. So, I'm going to add that to my topics as well here. Then, Joseph Eric Mensa, Ishira, you are always point thereby making learning more easier thank you for your support it's always a pleasure eric it's always a pleasure gabriel said thank you joseph eric 
thumbs up on the page. Thank you. Zolak said thank you. You are welcome. So give us a thumbs up on the video. I see a couple of you joining. When you join, consider to give us a thumbs up on the video. That is how we get more engagement on the video to reach as many students as possible. So together we can help a lot of students across the country and across uh, the continent at large. So let's go. Any questions, put it in the chat box for me. So let's go. Earnings per share. So we're going to dive deeper and look at a breakdown of it. The big question we need to ask ourselves is, what is the uh, objective of the standard? I mean, why is the standard? This standard was issued somewhere around 1999, there about 1997. 96, 97, they started, 1999 became more effective. But what is the e objective of the standard? In a simple language, the objective of IAS 33 is to prescribe principles for determining and presenting earnings per share amount to provide, oh sorry, to improve financial comparison between different entities in the same reporting period and different reporting periods for the same entity. Let me take that again. The objective of IAS 33 is to prescribe principles for determining and presenting earnings per share amount to improve performance comparison between different entities in the same reporting period and between different reporting periods for the same entity. So ultimately, what we are looking at is how we can present, how we can account for the earnings per share amount for an organization. Now, the reason why we want to account for this is to improve upon what? Comparison of the performance of the same entity between one period to another period. Okay? So, what was our earnings per share last year? What is our earnings per share this year? So, we can identify whether the entity is improving or not improving. Or, to enhance comparison between different entities in the same accounting year. Okay? Different entities in the same accounting year. So for instance, when we look at the earnings per share of Access Bank, when we look at the earnings per share of Societe General, when we look at the earnings per share of Ecobank, okay, for the year under consideration, maybe 2019 under consideration, how is it? And then how are they performing? Who is doing well than others? That is the objective of this particular standard to prescribe the uh, treatment of the amount to improve the comparison of between an entity's uh, performance from one period to another or different entities in the same accounting period under consideration. Now, as always, you remember that when we take standards, we need to look at uh, the objective, we need to look at the key definitions and all of those things. So I'm going to provide you some key definitions that will set the tone for our discussion today. So let's look at some key definitions. Key definitions. Now, remember that really this standard, the scope of this standard is for organizations whose shares are publicly traded on the stock exchange or who are preparing to get their shares traded on the stock exchange market, right? So that is the entities or this, this applies typically to those entities. So let's look at some key definitions here and I want you to stay with me carefully here. So key definitions. The first one is ordinary share. The second one is Potential ordinary shares. Ordinary share, potential ordinary shares or share. So let's take their definition one liner real quick. Ordinary share, these are also known as common stocks or common shares. This refers to an entity's instrument that is subordinate to all other classes of equity shareholders. So when we talk about, sorry, equity instrument, let's take that again. This is an equity instrument that is subordinate to all other classes of equity instruments. So the ordinary shares are the shares 
owned by what? The real owners of the company, right? The existing owners of the company. That is the ordinary shares. But we have what is also called potential ordinary shares. Now, listen to the word potential. Anytime you hear the word potential, it means the thing is not ready, but it is going to be ready somewhere in the future. So what are potential ordinary shares? These are also financial instruments or other contracts that may entitle its holder to ordinary shares. So potential ordinary shares are simply financial instruments or contracts that will give right to the holders of the shares of the companies, of the shares of the company. Now, there are a couple of examples of potential ordinary shares that we need to look at. So let's look at some examples of potential ordinary shares. Some examples. One, convertible debt. Two, convertible preferred shares. Three, share warrants. Four, share options. Five, share rights. Six, employee stock purchase plan. Seven, Contract rights to purchase shares. And then the last one is contingent issuance contracts. Contingent issuance contracts. Now, stay with me very carefully here. Stay with me very carefully here. All these are very important for us to understand what is going on and how to account for them. We are saying that potential ordinary shares are what? Financial instruments or other contract that may entitle its holder to ordinary shares. So with a potential ordinary shares, you don't have the shares now, but it has an element of later on giving you the ability to own some shares in the company. Now stay with me, look at some examples here. Let's start with the employee stock, uh, the employee stock purchase plans. This is usually in the US. Uh, I think the US is what I'm familiar with. That is typically in the US. It's a way that employees are able to buy shares uh, in the company with a tax uh, flexibility, or that is tax flexible or tax friendly. What does that mean? With the employee uh, stock purchase plan, what happens is that the entity will deduct some amount of money in the salaries of the employees and put it into the fund. It is more or less like a retirement fund, but it's not a retirement fund. So that money will be deducted every time, every time. And when it is due, the money in the fund will be used to buy some of the shares of the company. So it allows the employees to own shares in the company. That is what we mean by the employee stock purchase plans. But the deal is this. This is where the deal is. The shares that will be bought by the employees will sometimes be at a discount of 15% of the share price. What it means is that if at that time the share price is whatever amount, let's say the share price is $100 per share, they will buy it at around $85 per share so that when they sell it, they will be making out some profit in there. That is what we mean by employee stock purchase plans. Like I said, this is typically, uh, I'm familiar with the U.S., that this is available to help employees to actually buy shares in the company by deducting the money from their salary every year. It could be like, say, 10 years. Then once the money accumulates, we now use it to buy shares for them. That is one of the examples of potential ordinary shares. What it means is that immediately uh, uh, the company sets up an employee stock purchase plan, it now gives the employees rights or option to own shares in the company going into the future. And this will feed into when you are calculating the diluted earnings per share. That is why you need to understand how this whole thing works out. 
The next one is convertible debt. And you know those already, this is treated basically under IFRS uh, 9 financial instrument. One of the issues of a financial instrument is convertible debt. As the name suggests, these are debt stocks which give the holders the right, not the obligation, to convert their debt stock into equal amount of shares. So IAS 33 simply states that when an entity issues convertible loan note or convertible debt, the entity must also pretend as though the people are redeeming the shares right now so that we calculate the effects of that on the earnings per share of the company. That is where, again, diluted earnings per share is going to come into the picture. Next one, convertible preferred shares. The same thing you know already, preference shares, when they are convertible into, you know, preference shares technically are uh, creditors of the company. So if it is convertible into ordinary shares, again, that becomes potential ordinary shares. Then the next one is share warrants. Share warrants. The share warrant is also a document. It is actually a negotiable instrument that the, uh, the holder of the warrant has the right to the shares stated in the warrant. So it is a document and it's a negotiable instrument where the seal of the company will be on the document and it will read something like this, that uh, the holder of this warrant is entitled to say 1,000 shares of the company and it is share warrant. So immediately an entity issues a share warrant, it means that there is a component of what? Ownership in the shares there and that is also another example of potential ordinary shares. Then we come to share options. Share options, you will deal with this under IFRS 2 for corporate reporting students, share-based payment. This is also a payment uh, plan that management, that the company gives to its management. It is sometimes referred to as the golden handcuff. It is an opportunity given to the management to say that, hey, if you are going to work with us for the next five or ten years, you will have the rights to be able to buy shares in the company at a price determined, usually at the grant date. So immediately the company gives that share option to the management of the company. Normally it's for the big guys, not for the small guys, but for the big guy, the board, the, the board and the uh, uh, people who are in key position, those charming with governance. That is also there. So immediately the company issues a share option, there is a potential of what? Ordinary shares. And that also affects your diluted earnings per share. Then we have to the we come to the share rights. Another name for share rights is simply what we call uh, right issues. Okay? Right issues. So one way an entity will raise funding is to issue shares to the existing shareholders. But this is, the, this is the key aspect of it. With the right issue, what happens is that the shares are issued to the existing shareholders at a price below the current market value of the shares. At a price below the, market, uh, the current market value of the shares. So for instance, if the share is trading at $200 per share, a company will, do, will, will offer a right issue and it will be like say $100 per share. It depends on the company's uh, uh, policy and they can offer that to their shareholders. Then we come to contract rights to purchase shares. Now get this very well. Contract rights to purchase shares. This is a binding agreement between the entity and other parties to buy a certain number of shares at a certain set date in the future, at a certain price. That is what we mean by contract rights to purchase shares. Now, somebody will ask, okay, why will somebody sign this deal? Sometimes, as part of the financing, uh, future financing structure of the company, the company may issue this contract uh, rights to purchase shares, where people can buy their shares in the company, but it will be some time in the future, maybe in five years' time, you can buy 500,000 shares at $3.5 per share. What it means is that when it gets there and the share is trading at $7, the share is trading at $20, you will still buy it at the fixed price set in your contract rights to purchase in that case. Then the last one is contingent issuance contract. This usually occurs in business combination. 
This is usually occurs in business combination. So for those of you who are familiar with consolidated financial statements, if you have not done that, you'll be doing that later on definitely. But one of the ways to finance uh, uh, acquisitions is through the issue of shares. But sometimes the parent company that is the acquiring, acquire, the uh, company acquiring the uh, other company will say that, hey, we will issue the shares to you, but it will be somewhere in the future. So if two years to come, the company we have acquired is doing well, then we will issue some, some shares to you. It becomes what? A contingent issue. Meaning that, yes, we will issue the shares to you, but it is dependent on some future events that is going to be happening. These, all these, are what we refer to as potential ordinary shares. Please note that these events, two, four, six, eight, these eight events can affect your basic earnings per share or your diluted earnings per share. To be specific to you, the convertible debt will affect your uh, the diluted earnings per share. This is going to lead into dilution. 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 This is going to this is not going to lead into dilution because you are issuing the shares to existing shareholders. So this one, no dilution. Contract right to purchase, there is going to be some dilution in there. And then contingent issuance contract, there is going to be dilution in there. What are we saying? When it comes to the shares of the company, we can have ordinary shares. These are the financial instruments that are subordinate to the uh, equity instruments of the company. Then when it comes to the potential ordinary shares, these are financial instruments or contracts that may give rise to the ordinary shares of the company. So any questions, please, let me know in the chat box if there are any things that you would want me to clarify for you. And I'm going to post those as well on my Instagram page. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so let me see if we have some comments coming in there. All right, so I see some comments coming in there. Al Hassan Ali Baba said, May Almighty Allah bless you, Inshira. Amen. You are blessing me a lot. We thank God. Mohammed uh, Suleiman, please say, We would like you to teach manufacturing accounting, like the income statement question that came in the July sitting. That's financial reporting. Okay. Manufacturing, trading, profit, and loss accounts. All right, Mate. Let me add it. I think final account is here, but let me add that as well. Manufacturing accounting. That is like a merger between management accounting and financial reporting. So if you know management accounting, you can determine the cost of production. That is for the, from the manufacturing account. Then once you determine that, you can now bring that to the trading account. But we will look at that, Mohammed, uh, as we move ahead. Uh, Kennedy Onyango. Hi, Kennedy. I see you. You are welcome to the stream. All right. So if you have any questions, you put it in the chat box for me. And most importantly, uh, give us a thumbs up on the video when you join so we can get more engagement on the video. Right. So we've defined ordinary shares. We've defined potential ordinary shares. Let's look at the next definition. The next definition is to look at dilution, the word dilution. Remember I've mentioned that these things, some of them result into dilution in the earnings per share. So what do we mean by dilution? The standard defines dilution as a reduction in earnings per share or an increase in loss per share resulting from the assumptions that convertible instruments are converted that options or warrants are exercised. It's a long definition, but it's very simple. That is, that is a reduction in earnings per share or increase in loss per share resulting from the assumption that convertible instruments are converted, that options or warrants are exercised. So what does that mean? I've said this already, I was just reading the English for you to hear as well. So for instance, you issued convertible debt. It means that 
When the people convert the debt into shares, now your shares will go up. Now, if your shares are going up, it means new shareholders are coming in. If new shareholders are coming in, that means there is going to be dilution in your earnings per share. Meaning, if, like I illustrated, if you are getting 80 cents per share today, you will be dead. When they convert, you start getting only 60 cents per share. Or, when the company makes loss, you can also get that. Now, please note that when we say calculating earnings per share, it does not mean only when the company makes profit. We will get into that in a moment. But the standard requires that entities also calculate the loss per share. So if the company makes loss at the end of the day, they will still calculate their earnings per share, only that it will be the loss per share. So you have to also be careful on that one because the examiner can set a trap for you on that one. Then the next one, the next one, anti-dilution, anti-dilution. This refers to an increase in earnings per share or a reduction in loss per share resulting from the assumption that convertible instruments are converted, that options or warrants are exercised, or that ordinary shares are issued upon the satisfaction of specific conditions. So anti-dilution is the direct opposite of what? Dilution. But this is what is going to be happening. You see, sometimes some of these items, when they now exercise, it will rather increase the earnings per share. So not every day that when you deal with share options, maybe your earnings per share will be falling. No, sometimes after doing the workings, the diluted earnings per share figure will rather go up. So you are getting 80 cents here, but the diluted earnings per share will be, let's say, 89 cents. Which means that even if these people exercise their option, your share, uh, your earnings goes up. Why is that possible? Now listen carefully, why is that possible? Because for instance, when these guys convert their debt, you are no more going to be paying interest. Remember, if the interest you are paying is huge, interest is deducted before we get a profit for the year. Hence, when you no longer pay this interest, that interest will be added back to your profit, which means your profit figure will be reducing. Now, definitely the tax effect of that will also be taken out. But the interest net of tax is going to be very huge. And when we add that to your operating profit, you are going to be making a lot of profit. So sometimes, sometimes, these things will actually lead to anti-dilution, where there is no reduction in your earnings per share, but instead, there is an increase in your earnings per share. So that is also another key definition that we need to understand. Then... The last thing I would want to uh, also talk to you about is the requirement to present the earnings per share. Requirement to present the earnings per share. I've stated this already, but I'm also repeating it. It is very critical for you to understand. Now, an entity whose securities are publicly state traded, an entity whose securities are publicly traded, on that is in the process of public issuance must present on the face of the statement of comprehensive income basic and diluted earnings per share. So don't do shit shit. If your company shares are not listed, don't go and do shit shit and calculate any earnings per share and put it anywhere. No. It is either the company is listed, they are trading their stocks on the stock exchange market, or they are in the process of issuing their shares to the market, then certainly on the face of the statement of comprehensive income, you realize that the earnings per share has been calculated. So typically, this is what you see for a lot of these companies. Access Bank, for instance, Ghana, Access Bank PLC, you know it's a listed company. Um, MTN, also a listed company. Hence, when you look at their statement of comprehensive income, at the end of the day, uh, below it, you will look at their basic earnings per share. Normally, it's comparative. So maybe 20x5, 20x6. So you calculate the basic EPS for each of the period, then you will see diluted EPS for each of the period. Note that they will bring in the diluted EPS if they are having in their books some convertible loan notes, some employment purchase plan, or some share options, and the eight things we mentioned here, if any of them are present, it could result into the computation 
of the diluted earnings per share. So that is what you need to understand about that. I see a comment from someone. Let me look at it real quick. Benjamin and Ponsa Mensa, I see you. You are welcome to the stream. Kennedy Onyango said, share at start, 4,800. Profit at the tax, 4,000. Preference share dividend. This. The company did not make any new issue, but on this. Convertibles. Uh, Kennedy, what is the end result of your question? I'm seeing you listing a couple of things there, but I don't know exactly where you are driving it at. So please state it clearly for me what you are going into. Okay. So now that we've taken all of those English fundamental issues out of the way, let's look at some specific issues in here. So how do we calculate the earnings per share? And like I told you earlier, when it comes to the earnings per share, you're going to have what? The basic and then diluted. So we're first going to start with the basic earnings per share. The basic earnings per share. Now, like I mentioned in a moment ago, your earnings per share, okay, is simply equal to profit attributable to equity shareholders. Profit attributable to equity shareholders. Divided by weighted average number of equity shares. Wait till that red number of equity shares. For the purpose of my presentation, I'm going to be working with tax. That is profit of the tax. It's the same thing here. Then I'm also going to work with wins. Okay? So anywhere I quote wins, you know it is weighted average number of equity shares. Anywhere I quote part, you should know that that is profit attributable to equity shareholders. Now, that is very important. The numerator is profit attributable to equity shareholders because the part is always the profit after all expenses, stay with me carefully, tax, dividend to preference shareholders, and dividend to minority shareholders. So when we say profit attributable to equity shareholders, we mean how much profit will be left after we take out all expenses, after we pay, after we pay tax, certainly the tax for the year, after we pay dividend to the preference shareholders, and after we pay dividend to minority shareholders. Now, this is where group accounts comes in. Remember, uh, uh, group accounts, right? If you have not done that, don't worry. You will get there, you will do it. When we have a company and we don't 100% own that company, let's say we have a subsidiary and we own like 85% and someone else owns 15%, the dividends we pay to them must be taken out so that we will not get the profit attributable to the equity shareholders, to the parent shareholders of the company under consideration. That, so that is your part. Profit after all expenses, tax, dividend to preference shareholders, and minority shareholders. Then your wins, okay? Your wins is simply the average of your opening shares and any number of shares that were issued during the year. So your wins is the shares outstanding. Shares outstanding and new shares issued taken at the timing ratio, or sometimes it is called the weighing factor. All this English will make sense in a moment, so stay with me very carefully. So, the weighing is your outstanding shares. 
taking into consideration any shares that you issue during the year. Now, please note that even though we are using the word new shares issue, if there is share option, there is convertible debt, there is uh, employment or employees purchase plan, all of those things will also be factored. Then we'll take into consideration the timing ratio. I'm going to come to the timing ratio thing in a moment as we begin the journey on the basic earnings per share. So basically, earnings per share part over weight, period. So to make it simple, it is part over weight. Please know that always, if you remember my illustrations here, I was telling you that, let's say the earnings per share is 80 cents. Let's say the earnings per share is 95 cents. Because the earnings per share has to always be represented in the smallest unit of the currency. Take note of this very well. The earnings per share has to be represented in the smallest unit of the currency. For that reason, we multiply this by 100. Not 100%, but 100 Ghana cities, 100 dollars, 100 pounds, 100 whatever currency you are thinking about. Because our earnings per share must be expressed in the smallest unit of the currency. Put in the comment box, put in the chat box any questions you have for me. I see some comments coming in there. Let me look at them. Let's see. And give us a thumbs up on the video. I see some of you guys joining. Kennedy, Kennedy said, can you help me dealing with diluted earnings per share? Okay, so Kennedy, you stay uh, connected. When we get to diluted earnings per share, your question will be answered. Nicole Williams. Hey, Nicole, it's been a long time, eh? Since I heard from you, Lamin Ulams. Hello, Lamin. You are welcome to the stream. Chosi Chamado said, What are your thoughts on using days, 365 days or months, with very high figures such as thousands, hundred thousands, might produce a difference of 0.0? As a teacher, how do you view this in terms of grading? Uh, I think your Chosi Chamado, your question is about the timing ratio or the weighing thing, uh, the standard is uh, to use the months. Okay, so 2 over uh, uh, 12, 6 over 12, 5 over 12, that way, rather than the days. Okay, because the days sometimes, it become, then you have to count. How many days do we have? 309? No, so just deal with the months and go ahead. If that is exactly, if I get your question right, you're talking about the weighing factor or the timing ratio. The standard just goes with the man, so we're going to stay with the man. Rudolph uh, Tengapari, I see you. You are welcome to the stream. And I see some of you as well giving us a thumbs up on the video. Welcome to the stream. All right. So let's begin the journey. And let's start with the basic earnings spare share. Let's see if we can snap this up as well okay now one last thing to talk about before we get into the computations is to ask ourselves why do we calculate the earnings per share in the first place in other words what are the importance of the earnings per share what are the importance? I mean, why the heck to, do we have to compute this? What does it tell shareholders? What does it tell users of the financial system? Now, remember, we've already said something about it in the intro, the objective of IS33, that it is to improve what? The performance of an organization by comparing it, right? But then beyond that, what does the earnings per share tell us? Couple of things, importance of EPS. I'm gonna try and see if I can give you some points here. So one, the EPS enables shareholders to easily determine how much dividend is paid to be able to determine how much dividend is payable, not how much dividend is paid. It helps shareholders to easily determine how much dividend is payable. Because remember, dividend usually is paid out of earnings. So as always, what happens is that your dividend per share will be less than your earnings per share because of retention of profits. 
So companies will retain profit. So if I know that earnings per share is 80 cents per share, then if the company is going to retain, let's say, 50% of the profit, then I expect that they should pay me a dividend of, say, 40 cents per share. So the earnings per share enable the uh, shareholders to be able to determine how much dividend is payable. That is one of the important. So both current shareholders and potential shareholders, so that if you want to buy the shares of the company, you look at their earnings, then you can determine what is likely to be happening. Two, earnings per share is easy for the non-specialist users to understand. You see, not all investors are sophisticated, they understand financial statements, they understand all the jargons, they understand all the uh, profits, working capital, no, 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 no. There are some people that are, we call them lay investors. So at the end of the day, they want to find out, how much am I going to make in this deal? So for them, non-specialists like that, once they look at their financial statement, that is why it is put in the statement of comprehensive income for you so that once you pick the financial statement you go there and you see okay this is the earnings of the company okay yeah last year they made this earning this year they made this earning so non-specialists can also easily understand the financial statement because at the end of the day no matter what you report in the liability in the asset they are interested in the earnings especially quote unquote if you have broke investors who are interested in the annual release of funding for them then the last one any spare share is a more accurate indication of profitability. Any spare share is, the, is a more accurate indication of profitability. Because remember, this is what is left after we pay everything. What is left after we pay expenses? What is left after we pay taxes? What is left after we pay the preference shareholders? What is left after we pay minority interest shareholders or non-controlling interest? When we pay them, what is left? So it is able to, the only indicator that is more accurate of the profitability of the company. So that if you realize that the earnings per share is declining from year to year, you can make a decision that, hey, this company is not making a lot of money and then you can decide what it is that you need to do in order to make your investment decision. So that is what you need to understand when we talk about some of the important. Now, certainly, there are some limitations about the earnings per share because remember, we are dealing with profits after tax. And you will remember that profit after tax is subject to a lot of what? Manipulations. If the management wants to increase their earnings per share, all they can do is they may decide not to disclose certain expenses, so they will capitalize certain expenses instead of writing them off. Then they will decide not to provide for certain liabilities, even though they are supposed to provide for it, they won't provide for it, they will just disclose it in the footnotes. So there are a lot of manipulation, creative accounting, window dressing and all of those things that can affect the earnings per share. But with all of that, it is assumed that, hey, we can rely on that information and that can tell us about the future prospect of the company profitability it helped the non uh, financial experts to be able to understand and also to easily assess and know how much dividend that is payable to the shareholders so this is these are some of the importance we can talk about in relation to the earnings per share you good any questions in the comment box for me any questions in the comment box I see a comment coming in here. Um, Ernest Ampofo said, thanks boss, always a pleasure, Ernest. Give us a thumbs up when you enjoy the stream. So now that we've taken all of the theories, all of the stories, it's like some people are sitting down and they're like, oh, Shira, whatever you're talking about, that is not what I'm interested in. Just go to the thing. No, we need all of these things because some of you, the way you are, you are sitting down, you just want to see the calculations, dabi, dabi, dabi. If you don't get these things right, you will screw up in the calculations. So let's go in there and let's look at the various computations we can do here. So like I mentioned in the intro, when it comes to basic earnings per share, we're going to be looking at three things. Usually, when companies issue shares at full market price, full market price, also when companies make a bonus issue, and then number three, 
when companies make right issues. So these are the three uh, scenarios under basic and inspection. And we're going to take them one after the other, and then we break them down, and then we go ahead with it. So let's go. Issue of shares at full market price. Issue of shares at full market price. So, like the name suggests, issue of shares at full market price, this is where the entity issues what? New shares to uh, not existing shareholders, but to the public at large. So everybody can buy it, everybody has the rights to buy it. The deal here is that when we are calculating the earnings per share, looking at the issue of shares at full market price, it is going to be simple. So, your basic earnings per share is going to be your profit of the tax over your wins. Give me a moment. I'm back. Let's go. Times 100. Now, remember this times 100 there is not in percentages, though, so stay careful. Now, so the parts, the wins. The question here is this the profit of the tax, nothing will happen to it. We will just go to the statement of profit or loss, another comprehensive income, and then we will pick the profit of the tax for the year. That's all. But then the wins has to be computed. The wins has to be computed. Now, what will be the wins here? The weights will be equal to, stay with me carefully, the outstanding shares times the timing ratio, and that's going to be x over 12. That's the timing ratio. Okay? Stay with me carefully. Plus the shares. So this is outstanding shares before the issue. Let me be clear on that. Then we come to total shares after the issue. Times also the timing ratio. So when we add these up, that gives us the weighted average number of equity shares. Okay? Remember, the numerator here is not going to change. And under basic earnings per share, the profit for the year is not adjusted. It is under diluted earnings per share. When we issue convertible loan notes, that is where the profit after tax will be adjusted. But we are not there yet. So at where we are now, issue of shares at full market price, your basic earnings per share will be the profit after tax divided by the weighted average number of shares. How do you calculate the weighted average number of shares? That is the outstanding shares before the issue, okay? times the timing ratio, and I'll explain that in a moment, then the total shares after the issues times the timing ratio. So that gives you the weighted average number of equity shares. Now let's crunch some numbers. Let's crunch some numbers. So let me pull an illustration up here. Sebe Willi Kondumri. So Sebe Willi Limited had four million shares in issue on 1st April 20X9 on 1st September 20X9 the entity issued 5 million shares at $4.2 per share. If the profit, let's just go straight, if the profit of the tax for the year ended, the profit of the tax for the year ended, 31st March 20X, sorry, 20Y0 is how much? Oh, let's just say $25 million. 
calculate, I want to save this, calculate the earnings per share. So let's see. Seba Willie Limited has 4 million shares in issue on 1st April 20X9. On 1st September 20X9, the entity issued 5 million shares at $4.2 per share. If the profit after tax for the year ended is for the year ended 31st March 20Y0. Now stay carefully. From X9, you go to Y0. It's just letters numbers. Okay. Uh, it's $25 million. Calculate the earnings per share. So let's see how we can compute this question. This is just a simple scenario up there. I'm going to post it as well on Instagram so that in case you missed it, you can copy. Okay, so let's go. Now, the numerator, we don't have any headache. It's there. No P about that. But stay with me with the weighted average number of equity shares. We're going to compute the weighted average number of equity shares. What did we say? We said that the weighted average number of equity shares equals the outstanding shares before the issue. Now, when did the company issue the shares? That was on 1st September 20X9. So, before 1st September 20X9, how many shares were outstanding? That's 4 million shares. So, we're going to have if you let me just write it here, 4 million shares times, stay with me, how many months before the issue of shares? So we started on 1st April and the shares was issued on 1st September. So let's see, April, May, June, July, August, because September is 1st, not 30th. So September will not be passed. So April, May, June, July, August. So that is 5 months. So that's going to be 5 over 12. All right, plus total shares after the issue. Now, on 1st September, the company issued 5 million shares. So from 1st September, how many shares will we be having? We'll be having 5 plus 4, and that's going to be 9 million shares. Now, how many months was that? How many months was that to the end of the year? So from 1st April to 31st March, how many months will that be? Certainly eight, right? So September, October, November, December, January, February, March. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, because five was here. Because it has to be 12. So seven over 12. Does it make sense? So let's punch it out and let's see what we've got. So let me grab my Casio calculator. And let's see what we got. I could punch all together, right? So that I don't have to... 5 over 12, I'm punching 2 here, you know, 5 over 12 by 4, close the bracket, plus bracket open, oh, 7 over 12 times 9, and I'm getting <laughs> 6.92 million shares, approximately. Okay, 6.92 million shares. And you can confirm that, okay? 6.92 million shares. 6.92 million shares. So, I hope you get a concept very well. Outstanding shares before the issue, 4 million. As at 1st April, they were having 4 million shares. Simple. Then how long did that share exist before the issue? It was five months from 1st April to 31st August or 30th August. So 5 over 12. Then, now after the issue, how many shares are we having? That's why we said total shares after issue. And that's going to be the 5 million plus the 4 million. And that's going to be uh, 9 million. And that existed for 7 months. So that is going to be 6.92 million shares. So, knowing our profits to be $25 million, let's see what we have for that. So, let me now claim my survey relief question. So that our basic earnings per share will be equal to the profit of $25 million divided by 6.92 million. So let's see what we get. 
this is gonna be some huge an infant an infant share there. 25 mil divided by 6.92. So I'm getting like uh 3.61 dollars. But remember I told you that it could be represented in the smallest unit of the currency. So if you want to change it into cents, you multiply it by 100 and that will be 3.61 times 100. This is huge, like 361 cents, okay? So usually when it is big like this, we will still represent it in the, uh, in the dollar, okay, in the dollar. But usually what happens is that you will get it in the minus currency so that when you change it into cents, it will be big. But this one is 361 cents, so we will leave it in the dollars three dollars sixty one cents so that is what you need to understand in that case i'm seeing a comment from sarah Pinsan. let me see i thought some sarah be on. <laughs> so let's see sarah clay clayham sorry sarah insurer please take sorry if i mentioned your name wrong okay sarah Insurer, please take the calculation for the weights again. Thank you. Okay, so let's look at the weights again. She said we should look at the weights again. So the weights, the shares outstanding on 1st April, that is the beginning of the year, is 4 million. Okay, 4 million shares. And the shares were issued on uh, 1st September. So April, May, June, July, August. April, May, June, July, August. The shares were issued on 1st September. So September is not part, it is up to 30th August. So that 4 million shares was there for 5 months. That's why we do the 5 over 12. Then the second crunch of it is the total shares after the issue times X over 12. So now on 1st September, after the issue, how many shares do we have? We issued 5 million shares, okay? And we were already having 4 million shares. So now, 5 plus 4 will be 9 million shares. So that 9 million shares was there from the 1st September to the end of the year, which is the 31st uh, of March, 20Y0. And so that is 7 months. Usually the trick is that when you finish, the 2 must add up to the 12 months. So that is 7 months. So 9 million by 7 over 12. So you punch this arithmetically and I got 6.92. You can punch it and see if you get the same figure. If you didn't get the same figure, then certainly your answer will be different from mine, okay? So you just punch it and see. So, um, Sarah, that is how we do the computation. Let me know if it is clear, clearer now. If it is not, let me know the specific challenge then I can uh, deal with that for you. So that is how we deal with the basic earnings per share basic earnings per share for full issue so any questions put it in the chat for me um, so you can put it down briefly and then let's go quickly and let's go Any questions, please put it in the chat box for me. All right, so let's go to the second one. And that is bonus issue bonus issue bonus issue and i'll be concluding around that today so that tomorrow we will look at the rest of them and then friday we uh put them together in a single fully uh any special question then you see how all these pieces put together so bonus issue. Now listen to the word bonus. Anything bonus means it is free. All right. 
So bonus issue simply refers to or can be defined as the issue of new shares to existing shareholders at no price. Okay, so it's like free shares. Now, why will a company make a bonus issue? Remember, many of the financial institutions in the country, under the, when the Bank of Ghana raised the minimum capital requirement, many of them didn't have to inject any new capital. They didn't bring any money on board, but they met the minimum capital requirement. Why? Because they were having a lot of reserves there. So when reserves are converted into equity shares, that means that the entity is issuing some free shares to the shareholders. So you're a shareholder, you won't pay anything, but you're going to be getting what? More shares. That is bonus issue. The reverse of that is the right issue where we are issuing the shares exclusively to the existing shareholders, but they're going to pay something. And certainly they will pay something below the current market value, but they will pay something. But bonus issue, you're getting more shares at no price. So how do we deal with the uh, earnings per share where a company makes a bonus issue. The same thing, our basic earnings per share will be the part of our wings times 100. But then, this time around, this is the thing that happens. There is an assumption we use here, and I want you to stay with me carefully on this one. Under bonus issue, under bonus issue, um, I see a comment there under the bonus issue. Let me see if I can handle that. Chosi Chamando said, could you give an example of bonus issue of three for one or higher? And examples are always two for one. I would like to see something different. Okay, so for instance, I'll come to a question in a moment. Okay, I'll come to a question in a moment. Then you will see uh, how it is like. So when it comes to bonus issues, this is it. It is assumed that the bonus issues are made at the beginning of the year. Stay with me carefully. So in the question, irrespective of when the bonus issue was actually made, we assume that it was made at the beginning of the year. For that reason, with bonus issues, first, we will not take into consideration the uh, timing ratio or the weighing factor. But there is an exception to that rule where we will be taking the bonus factor into consideration. And I'll come to that place in a moment. And I want you to stay with me carefully on that. So traditionally, we assume that bonus issues occur at the beginning of the year. For that reason, since they occur at the beginning of the year, it means that the weighted average number of equity shares will simply going to be equal to this. This. So we will say something like this. The outstanding shares before the right issues. Sorry, outstanding shares before bonus issue. Okay? Plus the number of shares in the bonus issue. Simple. So here we won't take into consideration anything like a uh, timing ratio whatever the heck that one no 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 no. we're not gonna do that we're not gonna do that so we just assume that the shares were issued at the beginning of the year for that reason it was already there because really bonus issues should be made at the beginning of the year okay not in the middle of the year before the management will decide they might have decided so we assume that it occurs at the beginning of the year so that is the idea very simple sweet straight to the point let's look at a simple illustration in here i think we could use the same seven condombre illustration but let me take another illustration nectar limited had an issue Whatever, let's say 25,000 shares at 1st October 20Y, 20X6 on thirtieth November 20X6, it's made a bonus issue of uh, someone said I should do I shouldn't do one for two 
I should do something like three for one. Okay, so bonus issue of three for one. Bonus issues of three for one. If the profit of the tax for the year ended 30th September 20x7 is, uh, let's just say, something like, oh, $10 million. Calculate the basic earnings per share. You're good? So put it down for less four. Nectar Limited has in each year 25,000 shares at 1st October 20x6. On 30th of November 20x6, it made a bonus issue of 3 for 1. If the part for the year ended 30th of September 20x7 is a base $10 million, calculate the basic earnings per share. So let me snap it as well. Okay, Sarah Clenham said uh, she's okay now. Okay, that is good. Okay, let's numbers. Boom. So let's go. So let's see what's going on here. Remember what I said? We're going to be assuming that the bonus issued occurred at the beginning of the year. So we won't take into consideration in the timing ratio, blah, blah, blah. So what will we do? Simple. Stay with me carefully here. Our starting shares before the bonus issue. If you check... Uh, Nectar Limited had an issue, how many shares? 25,000 shares, so let's bring that up. This 3 for, this 3 for, this thing will give me some decimal, 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 decimal. Okay, it's okay, let's leave it at 25,000 shares. It will give me decimal, let's go. Then plus number of shares in the bonus issue, look at it. The bonus issue is that, it made a bonus issue of 3 for 1, 3 for 1, 3 for 1, 3 for 1, 3 for 1. 3 for 1 simply means that we give you 3 new shares for every one that you are having. Okay? We give you 3 new shares for every one that you are having. So it means the number of shares in the bonus issue. So our bonus issue is going to be 3 for 1. So it will be 25,000 times 3. And that's going to be 75,000. Funny enough, almost always the bonus issue is more than the one we are already having. So that's 75,000. So we add it up, and that's going to be 100,000 shares. Does it make sense? Very simple, sweet, sweet to the point, right? So uh, we give you 3 for 1, so 25,000 times 3 and then you go away in that case. If they say one for three, it means we give you one for every three. If you say three for one, we give you three for every one. So you have to understand the positioning of the uh, things. So now that we have this, let's get our basic EPS. We made a profit of 10 million. We divide that by 100,000 shares. And so let's see what we have. 100,000 is one. 0 0.1 million, so I can do 10 over 0 0.1, and that's about 100. Am I right? Yep. Mm, that's about $100. So it's still a huge thing there. So again here, if you multiply it by 100, you will get in cents, and it will be a bigger cent. So I uh, will just keep it as hundred dollars in that case. So that is how we deal with the bonus issue. Very simple, straight to the point. We assume that the issue okay or the issue okay at the beginning of the year. Any questions, please put it in the chat for me. Uh, Nana Apia Kubi said, I have now understood where it was quite confusing to me. Okay, that's great. That's great.
All right, so that is it about uh, this. Remember I told you there is an exception to this rule. There are times where we need to apply a bonus fraction to the shares outside because if we give you free shares, there is some element of bonus in there. Uh, and we need to apply the bonus fraction to the shares outstanding prior to the bonus issue. And I will explain uh, that uh, tomorrow, God willing. Because of time constraints, I would have to sign off for today in here. My uh, next uh, evening class, today is Wednesday, Management Accounting. It's in the next 10 or 15 minutes, and uh, I'll be going in for that. So I'll be concluding here today, and that is Ending Special Part 1. God willing, tomorrow we will continue with the uh, right issue. Then we will look at the diluted earnings per share. Any questions, you please put it in the chat box for me. And uh, remember also that we are having a limited offer uh, to enable students study directly under my mentorship at 325 Ghana cities per paper. So if you want to get access to financial reporting, get access to all the accounting standards, all the content, get access to my ebooks, our question case catalog, and also be able to join our weekly Zoom sessions and study directly under my mentorship, then you can uh, call or WhatsApp 050-114-9296. Zero five zero one one four nine two nine six. You can call or WhatsApp uh, that line to get access to our courses and study just at three hundred and twenty-five Ghana cities. So if you are not attending lectures, it's a way for you to get access to our full lecture course and join our weekly Zoom sessions and get access to all the lecture videos and study directly under my mentorship. That will help you and take everything that you are learning now to a whole new level. In that case, so uh, if you are outside Ghana, the code is plus two three three. Nicole, I think you are asking of code. If you are outside Ghana, it's plus two three three five zero one one four nine two nine six. If you are outside Ghana, so you can call or WhatsApp that line and uh, just request and say, hey, sure, I want to be part of your course. And that is a limited offer. The three two five Ghana cities is a limited offer. Uh, we are looking uh, for a certain number of students. Once we hit that limit, uh, that offer will be gone, and then you will have to do the regular payments for that. So thank you very much for joining the stream today. It's always a pleasure coming your way. I'm always thrilled with the engagement that we have on the channel. Let's see and give some shout-outs real quick to some people before we finally say goodbye. So Jamila, Kwachi, Isaac, Zolak, Richard, Vincent, Marfo, Gabriel, Charles, Joseph, uh, Al Hassan, Kennedy, Alibaba, Benjamin, Chinonso, and everybody Nicole, Lamino, Chosi Chamado, Ernest, Rudolph, Sarah, Nana, Pia, Kubi, my boy. And everybody, thank you very much for joining the stream. It's always a pleasure coming your way. I'll see you same time tomorrow, 4 30 p.m., as we continue with the part two of this you can also follow me on instagram at insurer premium because details of that will be posted there and essence of this discussion will also be posted on instagram so you can stay connected and continue to follow me so thank you any uh, inquiry you reach us 050-114-9296 i'll see you same time tomorrow as we continue with our discussion remember we have eight weeks more to go in case you have not started studying you have to start studying. Eight weeks more to go. You can do a lot of harms. You can do a lot of damages. And you can take your life to the next level. My objective is to assist you to be able to study and prepare well for the examination. And most importantly, pass the exams and take your life to the next level. So you stay blessed. And I'll see you same time tomorrow as we continue with our discussion. Bye-bye.